Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Helen Engelhardt, and together with Lydia Deppel, we are the organizers of this Congress. We are very glad to welcome you here today to the first edition of the Food System Change Online Congress. Our special thanks go to all the speakers and panelists and all people having been involved in the preparations of the Congress. We also want to acknowledge the fundamental support of the German Environment Agency and the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation and the Nuclear Safety. During the next three days, we will um, have pioneers from all over Europe presenting their initiatives, all of which contribute to a more sustainable food system. A sustainable food system that we so urgently need to protect the climate and also to reach all of the 17 sustainable development goals. The question that is guiding us through this Congress is, how do we build the bridges that are necessary to make these initiatives grow and also be to become more visible, both for policymakers and civil society. I wish you now a pleasant time discussing and elaborating on the way forward. Please feel free to also look on our website in the under the section outcome, you find all kinds of materials that we from our NAHAF team developed in order to provide you with background information on the niches. I hope you feel comfortable in this virtual space. And if there are any questions, needs, or comments, please don't hesitate to approach us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. And also a good morning and a warm welcome to all of you from my side. My name is Ribana Bergman, and I'll be your facilitator for the next three days. I'm very glad to welcome over 600 participants to this event. And also, um, we are thrilled that over 40 speakers and panelists from all over Europe and even further um, accepted our invitation. Um, during this Congress, we will be traveling virtually around Europe to find answers and best practices in old techniques, but also in uh, new technologies and in many different ways of cooperation. And as agriculture is described as a practice of hope, I'm also sure that we will find hope <laughs> in this Congress and um, hope that we need to be prepared uh, for, what is, for what the world is facing and hope to convince those in power to act. And you already know we're all in the same boat and we need to say uh, we are already in the same storm. Um, but the good news is that we can make change happen and I'm very excited about our fruitful exchange. And so now I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Mr. Peter Hübner. He has a very special story to tell you. The stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ribana, and welcome everybody here to the Food System Change Online Congress. My name is Peter Hübner. I'm an animal rights um, activist. As the name of Sarkast is changing or uh, consumption pattern can and will have positive impact on our environment. And we will receive more empathy for our living creature on earth. I myself grew up on the outskirts of town and got involved with animals in at very early age. My grandparents had an active farm with livestock and also slaughtered on the farm. We children helped with the slaughter at the time. We ourselves have had rabbits which have been babies in April. In the fall, these were then slaughtered. I was probably three years old when I considered whiteness this for the first time. I had cried, but Christmas, I was very proud that my rabbit, my rabbit has the very most delicious taste. The next year, I want to slaughter the rabbit by myself. Well, I was allowed to process it after the actual killing with the help of my father. For me, it was a normal process. If you want to eat meat, you have to be able to kill animals. That is what I learned as a child. Yes, I have loved the animals. At least that was what I was thinking. I later began an apprenticeship as a butcher. Within the processing, everything was normal, except 
that the poor quality of the meat amazed me. In the slaughterhouse, I was shocked. Lack of empathy and compassion characterized the pictures. Animal transporters, where you could see the fear and the tortures animals, indicate stunning of the animals and much more. Many colleagues drank alcohol at breakfast because otherwise it would have been difficult to experience the work. This was also noticeable in my private life. I myself prefer to solve problems and conflicts with my fist rather than with arguments. I noticed the cruelty of factory farming and decided even then to fight against the system. My meat came from farmers I knew. I continued to slaughter for a few years, but not professional at farmers where I know that the animals has place in a good life. But there wasn't a human slaughtering. Nobody liked to die. Some years later, one day I was in my vacation home in Sweden. I was fishing. I brought a pike, a small fish. I got on board and wanted to kill him. I couldn't. I can't do that. I freed this fish and put it back in the water. I could not kill anymore. For me, my whole life changed. Because if I can't kill, then I can't eat animal products anymore. Just a few days later, I was back home. I went to work with a sausage sandwich. In the afternoon, I come back with a sausage sandwich. I was vegan. From now, from one second to each other, I was vegan. I come home. My wife was surprised, but she supported me. At first, she asked me, Peter, please go vegetarian. Think about it, milk and eggs. And I say, no, I can't torture animals anymore. So my wife supported me and she was vegan with me together in the same day. Even my mother became vegan when she was over 70 years old. A new life began for me. I became a pacifist, feeling free. The vegan diet has also had a positive effect on my health. My cholesterol is back in order. I have lost weight and even in sport, I'm more efficient. If I speak today with humans who did not create this step yet, I hear again and again the excuses. We are nevertheless always in such a way. Then I can only say that cannot and must not be a reason for not making a necessary change. Currently, factory farming plays a major role in the global warming, in the clearing of the rainforest, in the poisoning of the soil with pesticides and plant toxin. Billions of animals are killed for food that we don't need. Everyone can make a change. In our campaign, Butchers Against Animal Murders, Farmer, for, farmer butcher shows that they do can change. The slogan must go around the world. If I can change, so can you also. I welcome you and wish you an interesting Congress. Good luck to everybody, speaker to every speakers and wonderful day to everybody. Have a nice day, bye bye. Great, thank you for this honest and activating speech, Peter. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we will discover a lot more to learn and we will exchange a lot more about uh, experiences that change, may change our lives. <laughs> thank you. I so hope so. <laughs> so um, I would like to take a closer look at the overall agenda right now. I will just give you an insight about the structure of the Congress. So during the next three days, we will have uh, four sessions per day and each session will take about 90 minutes. And every session will begin with hands-on experiences and practical findings from different pioneers all over Europe. And in a second step, a further expert is asked to reflect on a broader implementation of these um, practices. 
And then in um, um, afterwards, um, an exchange, after the exchange, um, we will have a Q&A part to en enhance the discussion and to, mo to promote the exchange um, yeah, between all of you. And um, the last event of the day will usually be a panel discussion among experts from diverse disciplines, also including a Q&A session. And um, yeah, we will, of course, also have some breaks. And um, during our lunch and coffee breaks, we will provide uh, networking possibilities, if you like, because I think this is something that uh, really enriches um, being at a Congress, just also to exchange with everyone um, who's there. And um, our digital meeting hall um, has several topics and options, so you can um, explore it and try to have a chat with only one person, but also uh, with groups. So it's quite uh, interesting. And um, all details you find in, um, in our emails that we send to you and also in the chat. And also you find in the emails that um, every session has a special link. So each session um, needs a special access to participate, but this is also on the website. Okay, so <laughs> now I would like to present to you um, tomorrow morning. We prepared something very special for you. During the first coffee break, you will have the chance to attend the theater premiere of the group Garden Players um, that were visualizing ideas for our food system. Um, this is quite nice. And um, one other important uh, aspect, so the goal of this Congress is to create synergies all over Europe and to spread the word. So um, in order to make the most of this gathering of international experts, um, you will get the possibility to meet up in working groups to fill your expertise and all the resulting demands into one resolution. And our goal is to address this resolution to policymakers at EU, national and municipal level. And to participate in, in this, um, we would um, ask you to meet us in session four tomorrow on Tuesday at 11 a.m. so that we can develop it together. Um, at the end of the Congress, you will be given the chance to sign it also um, with your organization. And um, yeah. <laughs> A final discussion on this will be taking place on Wednesday afternoon before we close the conference. So this was, um, yeah, a lot of information. I, I have to add um, that the whole re event is being recorded and will be available on public websites by the end of this conference. So everything that you might probably miss, uh, you can um, catch up and uh, have a look afterwards. Okay, so today um, we will learn about the current challenges of the global food system and then highlight the need for transforming the system. Therefore, we will receive uh, insights by two researchers. At first, we will be listening to Dr. Benjamin Leon Bodieski. He's a researcher at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And secondly, uh, Stefanie Wunder from the Ecologic Institute will give us a better understanding of the theory of transformation. Um, please be aware to use the Q&A tool during the presentations at the bottom of your screen for any questions concerning the presentations. We will be discussing your questions after the two presentations within a 30 minutes frame. And now I'm very keen to invite our first speaker, Dr. Benjamin Leon Brodeski, to start his presentation on the nutrition transition, how our diets shape our planet and our health. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I have to say, this is a really great initiative and I'm very happy that I can support it. Um, I'll just now share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm Benjamin Budierski, agricultural economist at Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And the research I will be showing you today um, has been published recently um, in a 
in a scientific paper that you can access, open access. And it's of course not only my own research, but the work of an interdisciplinary team we have at PIC, the land use group, and um, uh, also our our research is to a large degree open source, and you can download, for example, the models we use to derive our results. Um, uh, today, I want to talk with you about the environmental and also the health consequences of our global food systems. As one of the first speakers, I probably owe a definition of what a global food system or what food systems are in general. So food systems describe um, the systems that produce uh, our food from the cradle to the grave, so from the production of food to processing till, till the consumption and even disposal of waste. Um, uh, but it also describes the whole socio-economic um, uh, cultural aspects that are connected to our food systems, the food environments in which consumers live, the economic incentives that shape the, the production and demand of food, and uh, all the cultural aspects that are connected to food. And food systems are incredibly diverse. Already a system or the, the, the diets and the consumption and the production is very different, for example, between Italy and Germany. And of course, worldwide, if you look at food systems, they are even more diverse. Still, what we found out is that there are some universal patterns that are uh, um, or that characterize the change of food systems worldwide, at least at the moment. And this is what we call the nutrition transition. Now, I want to show you a bit the consequences of this nutrition transition, um, first by some anecdotal images, and then later on also showing you some data. Let's start with this. So what you will see here are the diets of people, what a family eats within a week. And we will, we will, or I ordered these images by the, the per capita income of people. So how much people earn. And here you see a family um, uh, that is characterized by severe poverty and average income below a dollar per day. Um, so this is really the, the most severest poverty on our planet. And diets for such um, uh, poor people are usually quite similar all around the world. They consist of um, uh, a, usually a cereal and a pulse, uh, maize and peas, or rice and uh, rice and beans, or something like that. Very little dietary diversity, a lot of food scarcity and undernutrition. And still today, about 800 people on the planet um, uh, live in um, uh, yeah, food insecurity. If the incomes rise a bit, then the diets start to diversify. First, you see um, uh, fruits and vegetables appearing on the menu um, uh, and a larger diversity of staple crops like uh, pulses, roots, um, uh, and, and grains. Um, um, and you may also see the first animal products like here milk appearing on the menu. Then if people become even richer, here you see uh, a lower middle income um, uh, uh, country, um, uh, China around the rural China around the year 2000. Um, uh, so um, uh, China today looks already quite different, but what you can see here is a much larger diversity now of food. You see also larger quantities of animal products appearing and the first processed products like soda drinks, soy sauce, um, uh, tofu. And um, uh, then when you move from a middle income to a high income country, this is Germany, what you can see now is a largely um, uh, processed foods appearing on the menu to a much larger degree, also the share of animal products further increases. Um, <clears throat> and you see that many of the staples like grains are in a highly processed form, such as toast or pasta. Um, uh, yeah, and this nutrition transition is actually quite universal around the world. Um, uh, so let us have a look on a map. Here I try to, to collect a bit the data that describes our, um, uh, let's say, the, the, the diets worldwide. Um, uh, first of all, you can see on this map in green um, uh, countries which have low rates of obesity and low rates of underweight in the population. Be aware that this is the description of the year 1965. Um, uh, and what you can also see with these little symbols is that 
all around the world, people eat too little fruits and vegetables um, uh, that in high income countries, you already have um, uh, uh, too high consumption of animal products and of empty calories, such as sugar, oil, and alcohol. And you also have food waste um, uh, to, harsh, uh, to a large degree um, in some of the rich countries. Um, but even more importantly, you can see that quite a few countries have really high rates still of underweight and undernutrition. Um, in blue, more than 10% or more than 20% for dark blue of the share of population um, with a low body mass index or so, um, affected by underweight. You also have high rates of stunting in these, so too, too little body height in these countries um, and usually low dietary diversity. Um, uh, and now if we shift to the year 2010, you can see that the picture um, dramatically changes. Now actually we have a, a global north characterized by high consumption um, of animal products, of empty calories, um, high rates of food waste, and you can see really high rates now of obesity and overweight, um, ranging or increasing surpassing 20% of the population which is obese and often more than 50% of the population being overweight. Um, uh, yeah, and if we then project these trends into the future, we see that these, this overweight and obesity further increases and even reaches countries um, uh, such as um, well, um, uh, middle income countries. Um, you can see that only some sub-Saharan African countries still have a rather healthy uh, body weight and that um, uh, unhealthy patterns are actually all around the world. Of course, this has major consequences. Ah, no. Yeah, and uh, a different way of, of showing this is here now the population um, divided by body mass index. So currently we are about here. So we have... Um, um, uh, about um, uh, if you add up the children and the adults, about um, uh, seven or eight billion people on the planet. And uh, actually already to today in yellow, there's, you can see overweight in red, there's obesity. You can see that the rates of overweight and obesity are already much higher than um, uh, the people living with uh, too low body weight. And you can see that in the future, unfortunately, the number of people um, with low body weight does not substantially decrease, which is most importantly because of the high um, uh, population growth in the poorest countries of the world. But you can see that at the same time, the rate of overweight and obesity is projected to strongly increase. And um, uh, we estimate that by the year 2050, 4 billion people will be overweight and 1.5 billion globally obese. So these are, of course, extreme numbers and they also have consequences for um, public health. Or, or, um, uh, and here, this picture shows what people die or suffer from in the world in the year 2017. Um, in blue, you have non-communicable, non-infectious diseases. In red, you have the communicable infectious diseases plus the, nutrition, uh, the, the nutritional and maternal diseases. And in green, you have the things that we are usually afraid of when it comes to health, uh, which are injuries like road injuries or conflict and terror on the bottom right. But this is really compared to what we die or probability that you will die from conflict or terror or violence. Um, while most people actually die of, of, um, uh, of non-communicable diseases like Ischemic heart disease, stroke, or diverse forms of cancer. And if you now look at how much of these diseases um, are caused by risk factors which are um, uh, of dietary nature, um, uh, this is now in dark. You can see that a lot of the, 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 the uh, disability adjusted life years, what people die or suffer from in the world, can be explained by dietary risk factors. If you think about uh, diabetes, but also about certain forms of cancer and, and, and blood pressure, um, uh, uh, infarcts, etc., they all have dietary risk factors. Same, of course, here in red, uh, desertion related diseases like diarrhea. Uh, deficiency of iron, uh, vitamin, 
And you also have a higher likelihood of getting infectious diseases when you are malnourished, uh, for example, connected to, to measles or nowadays, of course, also corona. Um, yeah, and in total, these numbers, 7 million deaths or 255 million disability adjusted life years lost, which are lost or which can be attributed to unhealthy diets worldwide. So it's a massive health problem. So we can see that food systems, unfortunately, do not manage to achieve their primary goal, which is to provide healthy nutrition for the world population. But there's also a second problem connected to it, which is the environmental problem. So if we look not only at the per capita consumption of food, but also on the absolute uh, number of the food demand, then we estimate that the food demand compared to the year 2010 will increase by a further 50% until the year 2015. This is most importantly because our population is still growing. So we are currently at 7.8 billion people. We are estimating that population growth will go on till nine or 10 billion people in a, in a business as usual case. Um, we also see demographic change. We have increasing food waste and also the dietary composition changes. And if you look at the consumption of animal source foods here, the, the increase that is estimated in a business as usual scenario um, is even higher than the 50%. Here we are estimating roughly that the consumption of animal source foods will double until the year 2050 relative to 2010. Same for processed foods. So how can we actually provide this much food? Is it possible to produce that much food? Well, there are two options how you can produce more food. One is to expand, the other one is to intensify. And um, uh, we see that already today, roughly one third of global um, uh, surface area is used for agricultural production. Of these one third, another one third is the global cropland area. So 10% of the global um, land cover. And um, uh, but on the other hand, we saw in the in the last decades a relatively small increase of this um, uh, cropland area, um, just by another um, uh, roughly um, yeah um, ten percent of these of the current cropland area. But most of the increase of production actually came from intensification, and as you can see here, the yields maize. Um, around the, in uh, different world regions. In blue, it's sub-Saharan Africa. In brown, it's uh, North America. And you can see that the yields, in particular in the, in the high-income countries, have been strongly increasing over the last decades and still are actually continuing to increase. And there is, well, so it seems plausible that, that this trend will also, can also further increase. Um, and even more importantly, it is, of course, possible to close the yield gap so that poor countries um, uh, also can increase their, their yields um, uh, by a much higher level. So the pro problem in, is not that we cannot produce enough food. There are two problems. The first one is that a lot of people don't have the income to purchase that food. And the second pro produce is food sustainably. And that's um, the next problem that I want to look at. Um, already today, the food systems globally are responsible for about one third of global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. This is a study that came out just um, um, a few weeks ago. Um, and it adds not only up the, the emissions from agriculture um, and land use change, so that's deforestation and, and cultivation of wetlands, but it also adds transport, processing, packaging, retail, and waste. Um, and if you add all of these up, then you end up with about 30, uh, one third of global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, most of them coming from agricultural production and from land use change, but transport, processing, etc., are also adding something like a quarter of the total emissions a quarter of the total land, uh, food system emissions. Um, but greenhouse gas emissions are not the only environmental problem that is connected to, to food systems. But actually, food systems are the number one driver of quite a range of environmental problems. First of all, there's the biodiversity loss, which comes along when you deforest and change the land cover 
um, of a large part of the world's um, surface. And of course, also connected to the, the high inputs, the high uh, interference of, of cropland management into these natural ecosystems. Um, and we are living today in the in the world with, which has the sixth wave of extinction um, in terms of, of uh, biodiversity loss. Well, secondly, there's the land system change. So we have deforestation and the pressure here is highest in the tropical areas. So in the Amazon forest in Congo basin and in, in Indonesia. Um, we also have agriculture being the, the, the largest user of uh, fresh water um, for irrigation, which surpasses often the, the, the uh, safe thresholds for, for these ecosystems. Um, uh, when too much water is withdrawn from rivers. And finally, one of the largest pollutants is the nitrogen pollution, which um, is actually connected to quite a range of environmental problems, ranging from air pollution, groundwater pollution, um, uh, surface water, ocean pollution, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and ozone depletion, all connected to too high, um, to too high inputs of fertilizer, manure, um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, and to the to the surplus, which then goes into the environment in various forms. Um, uh, and here, just um, uh, showing that in our business as usual projections, this these trends also further continue. So this is a projection of the the, the global um, uh, forest area under a business usual scenario. You can and you can see that also the Congo Basin and the Amazon rainforest is further deforested. But all of these now, of course, have been trends which describe the business as usual. So the continu uh, continuation of past trends into the future. But of course, this is something that we can change. And um, starting already from the diet, of course, um, our current food systems are unsustainable and they make us eat bad food, which is neither healthy nor sustainable. But of course, there's the potential for the transformation. And a sustainable food system is possible. And um, uh, we also showed this in two studies, which I just want to shortly show before I come to the end. Um, first of all, there has been uh, this study by Marco Springmann and colleagues, um, uh, where we showed that um, uh, we can produce um, uh, enough food for the, for the future world population if we look at three major measures. The first one is to produce more efficient and cleaner. The second one is to reduce food losses and food waste and recycle the wastes um, and close the nutrient cycles. And the third one is to change diets. And um, you can see for the different types of environmental problems, greenhouse gas emission, cropland use, blue water use, nitrogen and phosphorus, that only when we combine all of these measures, we can reach actually into the safe zone, the green space here. A similar study has been done by Dieter Gerten and colleagues. Um, where we showed that if you keep the current food system as it is, but you want to respect the environmental thresholds, then you could only nourish a population of 3.4 billion people on this planet. But of course, there's also the potential for change or for improved efficiency, for changing diets, for closed nutrient loops, etc. And if you do that, you could actually nourish a population of up to 10.2 billion people on this planet sustainably without interfering with the environmental thresholds. Um, and as I said, one of the core points of this is uh, a changing diet uh, of people. And um, uh, this is a suggestion of, of, um, uh, of a healthy and sustainable diet developed by the Eat Lancet Commission, um, which suggests we should eat much more fruits um, and vegetables, uh, whole grains and nuts, and we should strongly reduce our consumption of animal sourced protein and highly processed um, uh, carbohydrates. Um, yeah, and with this, I come to an end. I'm looking forward to questions and maybe just a small announcement. Um, I'm planning to organize a summer school this summer and I'm still looking for participants. Unfortunately, our website is not yet online, but if you are interested in joining a summer school, which basically combines people from arts and science um, and practitioners, 
then please just write me an email and I will forward you the information when the summer school is going on. Thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you for this interesting presentation. And yeah, we got a lot to think about. And um, we can discuss that after our next presentation. So please um, add your questions in the, in the Q&A uh, tool. And um, now I would like to hand over to Stephanie Wunder. She will talk about the transformation of food systems. Right, thanks a lot uh, for the lovely introduction uh, and good morning. Um, just a quick question, can you see my screen? Wonderful. All right, so thanks a lot for the, for the invitation and uh, great actually that Benjamin just uh, nicely started with uh, laying out the, the challenges that we currently see in, in global food systems, but also already pointing to the solution that's uh, lovely to build on. Um, first of all, just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm Stephanie Wunder. I work at the Ecologic Institute here in Berlin. We're doing applied environmental research and policy consultancy, and I work there as a senior fellow and the coordinator of our food system, uh, coordinator food system. So I do coordinate our work on like land use and, and food system in many directions, be it like food loss and waste or dietary transitions. Um, but I think the, the key reason why I've also been invited is that we also have a, a broader look on, you know, what, what does it need to, to, for systems to change? What does it need to transform systems? And we did two years ago a study also for the Federal Environment Agency that kindly supports this event here as well, where we had a look uh, into these factors that, that lead to, to um, system transformation, not in particular to food, but um, in, in, in general terms. Um, and since we, in the next three days, will often hear about transformation and niches, I think it's, it's quite helpful actually to, to have a super quick um, introduction into uh, these terms and the theories behind it just to to understand better about the the role of, of these niches I actually do prefer I mean they're called you will see in these series niches but I actually much more appreciate words like you know pioneers and agents for change and um, because it's uh, and, and early adopters because actually uh, you're all doing like fantastic works and it's uh, a matter of time when this is getting out of the niche and it's more uh, talking about the pioneers. So what is transformation? Um, it's actually, we, we often talk about sustainable food systems. We sometimes talk about transforming food systems. And the question is, is that actually is there a difference or uh, is, is that actually the different words uh, for the same thing? And actually when you, when you start like understanding better, like, you know, is transformation different and start Googling it and, and look at the literature, you will immediately find yourself in literature about the collapse of the Soviet Union or Cal Polanyi about the great transformation that described like how we uh, started uh, with uh, what, what effects we have seen um, of, of industrialization. So it's not really connected to the whole scene of sustainability research per se, but uh, this term has, you know, since approximately 10 years uh, really taken over and is essentially describing that it's not about like, you know, slow change, more sustainability, but we really need, a, as we've seen in Benjamin's presentation, a radical um, change, um, really a system change, um, and you know, to that's why I put in this um, uh, kind of train pictures. It's like it's not about um, having a little less speed uh, driving against the wall, but essentially changing directions. So, if we understand that we need that radical change, and then wonder how can we actually manage that change? And how do these different elements of change interact and, and lead to systemic change? Then you immediately find yourself at this graph, uh, which is showing the, the multi-level perspective on, on system innovation by Frank Hiltz, um, now like almost 20 years old. A, you can see that we really need better graphic designers in picturing the future. But if you have a, 
you know, then a closer look, which I, you know, just I, I stay a bit on the surface here, but essentially what these graphs are showing you is that there is an interaction between three levels. Um, and the one on the bottom is the, the micro level. This is where we find a lot of uh, innovations, uh, really on, on small scale, the innovative ideas, the projects, the, the niche actors uh, and, and change agents. And what we see here is that in these niches, we, we often find really the, the are, these are like incubating rooms for radical ideas. So you can, people try things that are different from the existing social technological regime as they're small, as they're not challenging the whole system, they can flourish, there are learning processes. And they actually then later uh, when they grow uh, and if there are like windows of opportunity, like, you know, think about like smaller things of an election or think about like bigger things like uh, Fukushima or Chernobyl, like if there are windows of opportunity for uh, that, that support new ideas, then they get to the next level. And this next level is influencing the social technological, technical regime. Um, and which is, you know, a, more about the, the culture and practices, but also um, institutions. And then the bigger, the, the, the more macro level then is um, the, the landscape level, as we call it, which is changing much slower and is really about like paradigm change. But the key message is they do interact and these niche actors, these pioneers uh, really have a, an important role to play. But to take it into like kind of easier pictures or like to sum up, it's that, you know, these, these niches and their actors, they're actually the seeds for change. And um, if you're more have like a psychology background or so, you would also say they are so important because people's brains are actually pretty bad in ima imagining what you shouldn't do and how this future looks like. But you, you really need these positive, not just ideas, but places and practices and products um, that show you how this future could look like. So the seeing, feeling, tasting, hearing um, of, of these um, practices is so important. Um, and it's important to know also that it's, um, there's some, some evidence from, from research that shows that you actually need a relatively low level of you know, people practicing these new ideas from all kinds of social uh, classes, like approximately 5%, and then they, they take off pretty quickly. So that's quite important to know that once they, they grow, that is quite quickly, um, change is happening quite quickly. So we know it's super important that what's happening in these niches takes place, but we also see that you know, the levels above, the institutions, the regimes, um, the uh, political institutions also are also um, very important. So it's what I often see in the, uh, in the debate, uh, also particularly with practice actors, it's a bit of a either or, right? So you, you, you need to change everything yourself. You, it's, it's important what you individually consume and, and this is actually the way forward. Or, I mean, of course that's a bit black and white, but I do see these two um, developments. It is like, you know, policymakers need to change. I mean, I can't do anything really un unless, um, you know, policymakers change uh, the rules. But what I'm, it's actually, of course, both. And, you know, you can, you can be as active as you want in, in your niche in these small, um, um, activities and innovations. If the the rules of the game, so to say, don't change, it's really it's really difficult that we see this overall transformation. And I just take a, a very easy example. If I would now get to my kitchen and take two apples, a conventional one uh, and an organic one, then you do know, right? The one is you know having a double price or at least a much higher price for me to pay in the shop but if you have a look then about the societal costs actually what i spend more is like saving the society enormous costs uh, we have heard from benjamin like the, the the burden in the health system is enormous it's actually one of the biggest budgets that you see in national uh, economies and of course also the environmental burden uh, be it nitrogen lost or the I mean, I think it can't be said often of the six mass extinction phase we're right in. Um, this does have a large burden. So unless we do have a level playing field that is internal, internalizing external costs, as we call it, 
um, it's difficult to proceed. So this is super important, the whole political dimension of it. Then, of course, like if you then understand, okay, these pioneers, these niches that we talk about today and that we will hear more examples that are doing a good job, then the question is like, okay, so how can you support these activities? And a lot about this support is actually to demonstrate to society um, that you're doing a good job, um, that it's very relevant for society. And this is actually the, the, the key result uh, now shown in this pyramid that we uh, took out of the study that we did for the Federal Environment Agency, which is and was, that it's currently very difficult for these practice actors to demonstrate their impact because we have a very siloed um, debate about like, you know, projects focusing on greenhouse gas reduction, projects focusing on biodiversity um, saving, uh, projects for focusing on more sustainable cities. But you, you hardly find actually approaches that look of like, what are the approaches that have a holistic perspective and that do change for the better on many of these um, dimensions. And as we will hear in the next two days, many of these approaches do. So the question is like, how can we show that, right? How can we show the impact? And we developed a very um, easy to use system, both for the practice actors as well for those who are providing the funds, be it like foundations or actually policymakers um, to support these innovations to, to show that impact. And that is to show uh, environmental, economic and social. So the three dimensions of sustainability, but also show the transformative potential that you, you see in these um, initiatives. Um, and also that that's the bottom of the pyramid also, sh you know, gave very practical criteria and like kind of questions, you know, about the, 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 the basis for inf unfolding the transformational potential, which is, has to do with the organizational capability to act and the scalability of approaches. Happy to answer more on that uh, in, the, in the next uh, in, in Q&A if, if you're interested. But it's what I'm saying here is like, it's very important to demonstrate the impact um, to get then this um, support by funders and policymakers. Um, and there's a bit to learn for, for all of us because we usually also come from a certain side and don't understand you know, other uh, approaches. Maybe a quick example, let's say an urban gardening initiative in, in a city, you know, if, if you would apply for a, whatever a biodiversity fund, you know, of course you could prove a bit because you have more species to use and increase agro, um, uh, agrobiodiversity um, a bit, but you're doing so much more also like for the like improving the neighborhood, for providing education um, for children, for um, having places where, you know, heated cities can cool down, etc. cetera. Um, and another thing, and that's the, my almost last slide, is we, we often focus on what we need to do to, you know, support the, the good approaches. What's much less in the public debate is that we also need to think not just what to innovate, but also what to we call it exnovate, right? You know, like which practices have to phase out um, or to, to put it in the other way, we are also, you know, we all doing a lot of like research reports showing like how could it be better? But there is hardly, you know, an, a similar debate of like, why are all these good ideas not taken into practice? And this is, this has to do with the fact that there is not always a win-win. Of course, there's a lot of like, win lose and those actors that will lose in the future are often those that are more powerful now um, and obviously you know block this kind of change um, so we often actually need to leave our like you know comfortable zone of understanding like environmental issues or health issues or whatever we are experts in but also look into these factors that are blocking change so you might even find yourself debating lobby registers, transparency, corruption, all this kind of stuff has a lot of impact on actually the, if, how much change we will see in the future. So, and then last slide, uh, and this is hopefully, you know, opening the, the, the floor to the next two and a half days is, you know, it's super important for those um, pioneers to, to get connected, to join forces, to make your voice heard. Um, and it's great to, to see that 
learning also between different countries. So it's not just German um, examples presented here, but there's so much more to learn from, from other countries in this joining of forces and uh, not necessarily always needing to reinvent the wheel um, is, is very important in supporting that transformation. So that was it. Um, I will post the, the link to the, to the study also in the chat. Um, I hope that gave you a bit of an idea, like, you know, if we talk about transformation, what is it? What role do these pioneers play and what to do to um, support that from, from whatever side you're listening to that, be it practice or policy or research. So happy to hear a question. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. That was fantastic and very lively and motivating um, to hear. And I'm also glad that you highlighted that uh, yeah, politics play a much bigger role than sometimes consumers um, think. Um, yeah, it, of course, it is both, but it is, it is very important to, yeah, to call on politics in this issue. Um, yeah, I would like to hear your questions right now, if there are any. I saw in the Q and A. Um, yeah, <laughs> there is <laughs> one um, contribution um, that says thank you, <laughs> and it asks for um, specific approaches. Um, that lend themselves particularly well to such a holistic perspective, integrating the multiple dimensions of sustainability and thus of transform transformational change. Um, do you do you have an answer for that, Stephanie? Oh God, can you can you repeat that again? Sorry. Uh, it's <laughs> about the specific approaches um, that um, lend to a set to a holistic perspective, integrating the multiple dimensions of sustainability. I think the question is quite complex. <laughs> yeah, maybe, I mean, if there's a chance to, to, to get that person a voice, I don't know like how good Zoom is here in this, then that's probably helpful too, but yeah. I don't know about the technical opportunity. Yeah, here. this would be great. So Johanna Herigel, would you, would you like to speak up in, <laughs> in our webinar? then you uh, maybe can raise your hand and I can, oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so now you can ask your question, please. All right, hello, thank you for your um, input. Um, I was asking this question because you mentioned that there are so many um, aspects and um, dimensions to such a transformational change. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, there may be like specific, um, whether that is an idea or a concept or an approach that can help us think of all these multiple dimensions at the same time. So um, one that I really had in mind was um, agroecology or in that regard then political agroecology. Um, and I suppose here I, um, I was thinking of this because we are um, in, I'm from Zurich and we are working on um, trying to get to such a more systemic way of thinking, um, both within the movement um, of, uh, I mean, civil society movements around urban gardening and so on, urban agriculture, um, but then also in interaction with um, the city council um, and so on, to push them also to have a more sort of um, systemic approach to food overall um, and not be restricted to um, discuss access to green areas, but really sort of push for considering food as a basic life infrastructure next to housing, energy, and so on. Um, and we, we simply see sort of agroecology and political agroecology as helpful in that regard. And so I was thinking maybe you have ideas, all of you, of um, other um, concepts and, and approaches that you find helpful in that regard. So we exchange on that. Thanks. Thanks, Irana. That actually helped me a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, and even if I'm not 100% sure we're sharing the same um, thinking now here, um, how I understand your question is partly also 
how do we frame the problem? I mean, you said like concepts also to build on, that's true as well. And I think agroecology is a very, uh, is a very good concept. Um, um, you know, others talk about like circularity, um, about healthy and sustainable food systems, um, about sustainable production and consumption, um, or like, you know, particularly the food councils that you mentioned, like the slogan in Germany is like good food for all. So that's a, a bit catchier phrase than food sovereignty, but food sovereignty is also an important concept. So it's a bit of like how I see is like, how do you call the child, so to say? And it's maybe interesting to see that uh, last month, um, I mean, this, this debate does not just take place in this room here, but also had its place um, at uh, the, the FAO, the UN, uh, when it was about uh, the voluntary guidelines for um, nutrition and food systems. And they were seriously fighting about how to call that. And actually the first suggestion that was on the table was healthy and sustainable food systems. This did not get through because of the opposition of important private sector actors, but also like countries of Canada, US, New Zealand, uh, and, and others, um, Russia, etc. cetera. And, and now it is um, um, healthy diets from sustainable food systems. But long story short, I think this is an important question to ask. And I think agroecology is a good way forward, but also think about the other concepts. But it's, you're right, we, we need to, you know, understand food systems in a more holistic way, not just production or consumption and not just environment or health, but everything together. So, but don't know how the others think about it. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have the next question, and this one is, do you have best practice recommendations how to make our voice heard? Who would like to answer this one? Well, then I jump in. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, of course, there is no... Um, uh, no one fits all um, answer to that question. But as we also, you know, uh, identified in our little, you know, system for criteria and key questions that you should ask yourself, yeah, how big the transformative potential is. Um, two things play a big role. One is like really um, building alliances with similar actors. Um, again, I take an example that is not just like niche actors, but more from the science policy interface world that I'm from, you know, the moment when we build the EU food policy uh, coalition, it has much more uh, weight uh, in the discussion, or as you see, like from the food policy councils to take something, it has much more weight. So building alliances is important, but then also like, you know, to, to really actively work with media, um, whatever, like, is it print or social media, et cetera, but that, that plays a big role. Um, so, so maybe these two aspects as a starting point for the discussion. Maybe I would add to that. Um, uh, I think if you look at, at Fridays for Future and the large impact they had on uh, um, uh, the, the German policy as well, um, uh, I would say that this is probably a, um, uh, a way forward. So they, they really managed to, to make a big change in, in Germany, even though they might see it differently, but it, it had moved um, a lot. And I think that at the moment we are really in a similar phase now for the food system, uh, or this will be this will be very dominant in the political debate for the coming years, starting this year with the UN Food Summit, um, uh, but also in in German policy, etc. We have the nitrogen uh, nitrogen strategy, etc. And a lot of of things will be decided within within the next or within the coming years in this respect and. Um, so I, I think now is the now is the time to to get active as well. Yeah, thank you for your answers. Um, I hope this was um, yeah. I think this was <laughs> quite revealing. Um, then we have a next question, um, which is um, more about um, the problem of linear systems that actually are no, no longer yeah, what we need. <laughs> and um, I don't know actually which presentation you mean, Christoph Voivode, would you like to 
ask your question directly to the panel, then you uh, you would need to raise your hand. Okay, so now I give you the option to speak. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Um, this is uh, with regard to Stefanie's um, presentation. You showed this pyramid, um, you know, where you were talking about uh, that very often this holistic perspective is not um, uh, integrated in the project. And it's very difficult to get um, this uh, more broader perspective on uh, sustainability transformations and that this is needed and that many projects are actually very focused on a specific discipline, a specific approach, and where it is very difficult to actually understand um, the complex questions and approach those. Now, very often we have this issue um, with funding as well to um, you know, be more experimental, um, to have a more open-ended discussion. So what I'm referring to is this whole debate of, about transdisciplinarity, integrating um, agents and actors, especially from practice, with scientific and research approaches. So, and this is a much more complex question in terms of the funding structures that we have and that are in existence there. So I just would like to know your take on this. Um, because you have been working on in this field for quite some time. And I see that Uber is also funding your research, but then the question is how can this be translated into practice? Yeah, thanks. Thank thanks a lot, Christoph, for that question. Um, maybe a small correction in the starting phase. I'm not necessarily saying that the projects don't have the holistic perspective. Often they do have. I mean, if you're like planning a multi-generational house or you know whatever i'm taking different examples now every time right um you you do have or, or like food sharing or whatever right you have like different um elements of impacts that could be environmental that could be um, more society relevant or health or whatever right so the projects are not actually the problem it's more okay. like what you described in like you know how it is perceived how it is funded and um, what kind of researchers are working with you so mm -hmm. this is the problem to to show actually and um, you know like we're worth the funding because we are like actually providing all these benefits so um this is why we have this you know this kind of criteria and and guiding questions so that you can demonstrate actually your impact that's one thing but to to get back of what you said in terms of like experiments and um uh, having open ending uh, well uh, having open and uh, the discussion in terms of like we don't know yet where this is going because like transformation yeah. is essentially uh, not being sure about you know the end of the journey and this is actually fundamentally different to the whole logic of um of research right now uh, exactly. which is like measured also according to like publications and peer-reviewed journals so i would yeah. be very interested to hear like what benjamin thinks about it because this is again you know we need to think outside of the box if I, it's not just lobbying it's also like how do our scientific world looks like because if you do a transdisciplinary research project really working with practice actors and not just bombarding them with your research language you you can't really create like proper journal articles out of that but it is necessary that our research world is also working according to societal impact and not just publications so yeah. i can't agree more it's needed we need um experimental project funding that's not crystal clear about the results uh, because we also need these failing examples as well you know it's 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 important it's just like part of the journey and if you talk to to people innovation scene it's just normal right you know some will flourish some will not and we need actually funding and supporting systems and research and policy that do allow that as long as you're like transparent and learning um on the way and share that you know back to research and society thank you yeah i think benjamin you wanted to add something um, yeah, maybe just on the interdisciplinarity. I, um, uh, I mean, PIC is, as a research institute, um, uh, a very interdisciplinary institute, right? So we have uh, economists, uh, social scientists, uh, a lot of natural scientists, biologists, etc. And um, uh, 
it's not so easy actually to to bring those people together and to find a common language and this is really a learning process as well um, uh, which has to be started in my opinion early at university and um, uh, you, you usually uh, you, you are confronted with a lot of silos if i tell people i'm economist they already think i, I only want to make profit and money out of it and and uh, these prejudices are very deep so uh, it's so I would not only say it's not only the, the funding structure, there are quite a lot of funding structures already there. It's actually also that when you manage to do such a research, you can also publish it, but it's just very difficult to do it. And um, uh, that's, that's um, I think, a challenge for us also to, 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 learn, to learn exactly this. Okay. And that was just interdisciplinary. We were talking about transdisciplinary, which is not just like agricultural yeah. scientists, but farmers, <laughs> for yeah, example. Both, yeah. It's getting tricky. I like find a common language here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's go on with the next question. Um, um, it is talking of windows of opportunity. It seems that we are in the middle of one with the pandemic. Would you be able to identify a few actors or elements that might be blocking uh, change in health and diet changes right now? So yeah, Benjamin, please go on. Yeah, I mean, in the agricultural sector, I mean, you you don't need to search for a long time to, to find actors which are which are blocking. Um, uh, so I think it, it's it's quite clear which actors um, are not interested in a transformation there but it's it's also more than that right so you need to you need to give people a positive vision of of where they will end up to right and uh, also like conventional farmers often have the feeling that they that they are kind of the scapegoat of society um, which not always I can understand, but it, it's, it seems to be the case. And the question is, how how can you allow them a, a transformation that that is possible for them um, uh, with with their resources? And for example, many farmers are not so young, so they are not so it's not so easy for them to 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 adopt innovative new practices. And um, uh, so I think this is this is really. Uh, Require, requiring a deep structural change and that also requires changing people's mindsets and allowing transformation really requires also to 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 get those people in the boat with you so it, it requires actually a lot of societal um uh, yeah communication and and um uh, yeah and not only of the people which are kind of the 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 people that are already convinced but really also talking with the people that are not convinced Yeah, thank you. Yes, what I like to say to that, the problem with the pandemic is that we are currently fighting the effect and not the origin. We have to get out of the factory farming so we can prevent future pandemics in the near future. I think this is the key for the pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, the next question is also focusing on um, inequality, which I find also quite important, uh, very important. Um, the question is how you think we can eliminate inequality on the food distribution globally. So to go uh, so that the developing countries can feed their population sustainably. Yeah, I, I would try to answer on that one. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, it's really a matter of food distribution, not of food production at the moment, right? So we have enough food on the planet, um, uh, but there are some people who simply cannot afford it. So the, the prime reason for food insecurity is poverty and people, and next to that conflict, right? So we have two things, conflict and poverty. And um, uh, you really need to address the core problem, which is poverty. So you don't need to reduce the price of, 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 um, uh, of food until people can afford it, but you need to give people the money so that they can afford the, the food, which is already actually cheaper than it should be because it does not include all the environmental externalities. 
So um, I think this is a really a distributional debate that needs to be handled. And then the question is, uh, that was, I think, the second part of the question in the chat, um, what's, what, how, well, can a sustainable diet actually be afforded by, by, by people? So um, certain things in these diets are, are um, expensive, like um, fruits and vegetables being by tendency more expensive than sugar. Um, um, uh, but other things are actually not necessarily more expensive, right? So if you think about whole grains versus processed grains, I think they are cheaper. Um, uh, pulses are also rather cheap uh, and people still don't eat enough of them. Um, uh, and um, uh, if you look at fruits and vegetable consumption, if you don't look at supermarket prices, but at local um, uh, prices at, at local markets, Plus, if you consider the, the potential for home gardening, uh, et cetera, such, such diets, in my opinion, also become more affordable. And then the question is, if you are supporting as an environmental development or as a development agency, um, uh, some sort of food system as, you, as they do, right? They often build up um, complex um, uh, food supply chains for animal products because from a development perspective, animal products are nice because they provide a lot of livelihoods. Um, but this may be actually very detrimental in the long run for the environment and for the health of these communities, because we are speaking now about some processes which in a few decades um, uh, will, will still exist. So if you have uh, supported the build up of a, of, a, of a livestock industry in a developing country, that will still be there in 20 years time or in 30 years time, but then the problems will have been shifted in these countries from, from the problems of food insecurity also to malnourishment and again the problems of obesity, overweight, unbalanced nutrition, etc. Yeah, thank you. There was another part of the question, but I think you partly already answered it. Um, can small farmers in Africa and Asia adopt the diets that are proposed by uh, Eat Lancet and UN um, as sustainable? Yeah, I, I, the question is a bit how to promote the horticultural sector, in my opinion. And uh, that's, I think, really needed. I think that can also give a lot of income. It's in particular also something that small holders can do because the, you require little land if you produce horticultural crops. Um, and you get more money from it than, than from, uh, from uh, maize, etc. And if you look at certain food systems, like for example in China, they really managed to include smallholder farmers from horticulture into um, uh, the modern food, food system. So they, for example, the, the smallholders sell their, their crops at, in supermarkets. So they, they, they have access to supermarkets and then provide it also to urbanized population, et cetera. So I, I think this needs a bit of creative solutions, but I think it's possible. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I think also one of the biggest problem is the price dumping, that it's so cheap to buy animal products. Um, the main problem is that the government uh, give a lot of taxes in the um, in the animal products um, producing and make sufficient on the wrong place. We have enough food for 40 billion people, but unfortunately, we use it to feed the animal products. Um, that means uh, many people are hungry in this world and we have enough food. We need to promote the plant-based agriculture again to protect the planet and feed everyone. Nobody must be hungry in this planet. The problem is the price. The people like to buy everything cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and this is the wrong way. We have to put the money in the good products in the future in plant products. That is the main reason. And normally, one kilo of meat has to cost more than 80 euro that the people know that it destroys the planet. One cow is eating 100 uh, calorie of plant and get only four calories back. So it is terrible what we're doing with the world. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I think there's one question that is directly uh, for you, Peter. Um, maybe David, would you like to raise your hand so that I can um, let you speak up in the panel?
or if you don't want to, I would read the question. <laughs> Um, so, to what extent does your background as a former butcher has an impact on the way people react to your vegan outreach? Do you have the impression um, that it makes a difference to overcome resistance to change if people are approached by a person who has directly experienced industrial animal farming instead of someone without a practical or professional background? In the beginning of my activist living, I would say yes, but actually I say no, that don't make a difference. Um, the only thing is that we people have to understand that nobody is born to be bad or to um, torture animals or other living things. Um, when you have children, you never will see that they make a racism or a speciesism, they love each other. When you get older, We learn from our um, from our society to torture other peoples and living animals. So take a look in the in the what it's called Werbung in the in the advertisement advertising. You will see every every time funny animals at the first picture, and on the other side you see the product. But nobody shows the way in the middle how the animals are living and how they are slaughtered and how you torture them only for milk or for eggs. Never shows that. I think when we open our eyes and get reality, what we are buying, then we see, don't see a schnitzel, then we see a cow. When we saw milk, we saw a wrapped cow. A cow will be wrapped only to get a, get a baby that she get milk. If we notice and satisfies that, We don't have to learn, learn butcher or something else. But right now in this society, it's good to show that everybody can make a change. It doesn't matter if you're a girl or a man, if you're a slaughter or a um, baker, everybody can make a change. It doesn't matter where you come from. Yeah, that's a good point, I think. Um, we have another question and quite a little discussion going on in our chat. Uh, it is about um, how to motivate people. So the question was, I'm not sure to what extent presenting gloomy scenarios and strong criticism of nutritional behavior will motivate people to change their habits. So um, yeah, what do you think <laughs> about this, Benjamin? Would you like to start? Yeah, um, well, I think it's, we are at the beginning of the conference, right? And I was asked to, to, to talk about the problems, not about the solutions. Um, if you give me another 20 minutes, I will give you another presentation on, on uh, the, the, the potentials, um, the policy measures we need, maybe the policy instruments, um, uh, and also about uh, the, the positive sides that such an alternative future could have. Um, so, but I think there will be plenty of time in the next four days, uh, three days, two days, whatever, uh, to discuss this. Yeah, maybe I add a little thing uh, on that because um, we're also involved in another project that deals with the question, um, how to reduce food waste in consumer households and actually evaluating existing approaches to, to reach people. Uh, so to change their behavior. And it's quite interesting actually If you have a look, I mean, for food waste, actually, you don't have any evaluation of approaches or just very few that you can't compare. So if you have then have a look um, to the approaches that you have seen in, in different areas of environmental protection, be it like, you know, people going to hotels and using the towel twice or, um, you know, flying less or whatever, you know, there, there are examples where you could have a look like what's actually effective. And in this regard, it's quite interesting to see that, um, Indeed, it's not a lot about like gloomy pictures, it's all bad and it's, it's difficult to change, etc. It's, it's more like you actually see from advertisement. I mean, these are the people who know what they're doing because they actually want to sell their product. It's like commuting about positive emotion. It's fun. You want to be part of that crowd. Um, it's, you know, emphasizing this is the new social norm. You know, it's like you, you don't do this, you'd rather do that. And this, I think it's quite important to to learn actually from our more environmental community that things like 
well, often things like, you know, just like more information and more awareness will help. No, it's not. It's, it's more, you know, a step ahead uh, and, and thinking about like making it attractive and, and showing how it works um, and, you know, um, providing the actual uh, competences, you know, to, to, what you need to do to change your life that's more on the more um, language and narratives and um, you know, that, that kind of aspect uh, of it but of course at the same time we need the, the proper uh, political frameworks right you know the the good decision needs to be the the easy and affordable decision and that's where there's a long way to go right so it's not again just individual it's also the stuff that we need to change on the political level that's maybe spoiler alert <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I think there's another question that goes in this direction um, about people that are really um, yeah, concerned about this topic and um, would like to stay motivated and keep communicating this motivation to everyone. So how can, can you motivate people to yeah, be, um, yeah, to, to spread the message about food system change? What would you say to them? Well, maybe I try. <laughs> I, I think that um, we need to develop some kind of positive uh, food culture as well. So that it's a pleasure to talk about food at the table, for example. Um, uh, that this food culture embraces also, I mean, embraces pleasure in sense of tasting but also um, the environmental aspects, et cetera, so that when people sit down, they want to talk about food, they have knowledge about it, uh, they enjoy it. And this will, I think, create a lot of positive uh, feedback loops um, of people getting more interested in it. Maybe they then want to, to work as farmers or as, as food producers. Um, also bringing innovative new thoughts into into the system etc so um, and um, i think a classical example is the old food culture in, in italy in my opinion where whenever you sit on the table you talk about food and it's a it's enjoyable people love it right and i think something similar we need here as well yeah i think this is very motivating to hear um i think there was also somehow a question about um, the cultural or yeah the cultural background um, when we look at the eat lancet um, um, yeah at their um, findings and what they um, propose um, is it possible to adapt these um, proposals to all cultural backgrounds I think this is always the problem with a, with a global study, right? Um, um, uh, first of all, I think if you read the study, then you will see that it's it's not that you re that they recommend one diet for all, but that they kind of give ranges of of what they think, and they are quite wide ranges. But um, uh, I think, for example, it's it's quite clear that um, uh, that the current consumption of animal products simply exceeds what we can produce right and and i think we also uh, i think we should also rebuttal comments that for example cultures have always eaten meat etc and the, the thing is that we have never had so many people on the planet living on the planet as today and um, uh, it's also needed that cultures develop and adopt and change um, uh, and of course, there are sustainable ways of producing environmental products, um, uh, um, livestock products. Um, uh, and the, the question is, can you scale them up to nourish all the, the people? And then I would usually say no, right? It's, uh, you, you can have a purely pasture-fed animal, but it would be absolutely unrealistic to think that you can feed German meat consumption behavior with, with pasture-fed uh, cow um, uh, and and uh, the, most of the, the cow production comes from industrial livestock farming and um, uh, it's also then not fair as a consumer to say well I'm 
I'm eating this this pasture fed animal, so I'm fine. But um, this is, I mean, the, the the number of pasture area is or the, the quantity is, is fixed. And if I eat my my uh, cow or my com cow comes from these pastures, then another cow does not come from this pasture anymore. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, now there are only a few um, questions left about uh, publications. Uh, for example, Stephanie, <laughs> have you published yet about the food waste project? Sure, just check out our website, www.ecologic.eu. <laughs> so well, just like drop me an email, it's also easy to find. <laughs> okay, wonderful. And then, yeah, also the English translation, are there English, English translations at, at the website? Okay. Yes, we have everything in German and English. Great. Okay, so if anyone would like to ask a last question, please add it right now. <laughs> Or if you would like to raise your hand just to address our panelists, um, it's your last chance. <laughs> Okay, ah yeah, I see one person raising the hand. Okay, so I give you um, now the option to speak up. Okay, vielleicht kann Lücke es bieten. Um, I just wrote it uh, already on the, the question answers. And uh, um, first of all, there's very good evidence that uh, even the small amounts of animal-based products can improve the nutritional status of the very poor dramatically. Uh, because it has the advantage of being available all the time and uh, unlike uh, lots of vegetables they uh, grow. And second is um, there's so many, uh, I think um, Benjamin showed this uh, this map uh, on pasture land. There's incredible, such an incredible um, amount of pasture land which can be only used as such and not for crop production. So I think um, even though I fully agree that we eating too much meat, especially red meat, and maybe also too much uh, white meat or, or, or um, milk products, uh, it's um, neither realistic nor sustainable to propagate vegan uh, nutrition uh, for all parts of the world. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, maybe I, I respond first. <laughs> um, uh, so it's true that for, for the very poor, um, uh, any increase in dietary diversity um, uh, improves their nutrition. And um, this is definitely the case in, in uh, many low income countries. It's also that, for example, the Eat Lancet diet does not suggest to reduce meat to zero, even though it says it's possible to, to, to be vegan. But it also keeps a range there. And if um, in particular in the context of very low incomes, it's uh, certainly a, a, a good diversification if people eat animal products too. Um, uh, this is, however, limited, in my opinion, to low income countries. And most people today on the planet live in middle income countries and some live in high income countries. And in middle income countries, we really have the problem of widespread overweight, obesity. Um, already there, I would say that the access to, to, to sufficient animal protein is, is, is there. And um, the problems really come from processed foods already. Um, and and um, then it's not a question of price already anymore because the, the The unprocessed products would be cheaper if people um, um, uh, if people would buy them. Okay. Maybe I just want to add a small thing because um, we, we, certain. I mean, I, I do agree to what you said, um, and and still there is if it comes to low income countries, um, and still there are some arguments that come up always um, we gladly in this group it was not the we need to feed the world so we need to extend our agricultural land and more intensive etc but that's the usual thing of like we're getting more people there's more demand for animals so we need you know to to increase so that's the, the usual thing um, that we hear and, and you just mentioned one that also always pumps up pops up and that I would 
love to correct a bit, which is there's a credible amount of pasture that can only be used for uh, livestock. And if we're seriously, again, like leaving our little box of food now uh, and looking to the overall climate crisis, then land is really something we need also to produce energy to provide resources for the bioeconomy that currently also still is, you know, um, dependent on fossil fuel resources. And, and the fossil, you know, resources are so much less land intensive that the moment we change, we have this huge demand for land for bioenergy, bioplastics, whatsoever. So we're not necessarily talking about like food production, but we can also use them for uh, and, and by the way, like, you know, carbon storage, right? Just growing, you know, regrowing forests. So I, I think that's super important to say to adding to what Benjamin said, it's, it's very little anyway. Um, so we, we need to reduce consumption dramatically. Plus it will further shrink because of land degradation. I didn't mention that plus uh, other demands from the not food sector. Thank you. I think that this was a great session and I would like to wrap up now. And I think we made a big um, yeah, journey from the health and ecological burden that our actual system produces to the power that transformation can have and already has in many parts and in many projects. And um, I think we can stay motivated and um, of course there are topics such as meat consumption and inequality and how can we divide the land use in a way that really is sustainable um, and I'm very sure we will get deeper into these topics during the Congress and I would already like to invite you to the next session that will start at 11 o'clock and it is called climate friendly and sustainable farming methods. So I think some of these topics will be tackled there again. And I would like to thank you very much, our panelists, Stephanie, Benjamin and Peter. Um, you did a great job and <laughs> I'm sure we will um, keep in touch and yeah, get the discussion going. So thanks again, Urbana. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.